All right. On to Stephen A. Smith and Charles Barkley. Have you ever heard Stephen A. Smith before this? You've had to have. I may have. I used to watch sports shows in the house. You've probably heard Stephen A. Smith. Um, so I just want to play these this first clip here from... So I'll just kind of set it up a little bit. This was... What I'm going to play here was a podcast, a Stephen A. Smith show, and he had Charles Barkley on, and they were just talking about, you know, a bunch of different things, you know, sports and all that, like they normally would, but then they sort of dove into more political discussion, and that's what I am uh, interested in here. So we'll just play this first clip and then come back. Because I got a lot of love and respect for Gail. Yeah, she's a friend. I've but, known her yeah, for years. But, you know, man, there's some interesting times we're in, uh, a political climate. This uh, political climate we're in, where you know people are trying to block the vet, the the black vote in certain states. Okay, uh, first, and I'm not trying to get into all of this. This isn't even again the point of why I wanted to bring this up. But who is trying to block the black vote? <laughs> point out the person. What legislation is being pre presented to prevent the black vote? Like, this is one of those topics that just gets kind of said, and you're supposed to just believe it. Mm -hmm. um, it's just not true, right? Like, asking people to have an ID to vote is not blocking the black vote. In fact, you could even make a better argument that it's racist to suggest that asking for an ID means black people can't vote. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. as if black people can't figure out how to get an ID. It's idiotic, um, but again, just want to make that point. This isn't what I care about necessarily in here. Just a a point to hear in your life and ignore because it's not true. But we'll move along. Uh, I think we really need to pay attention to that. Uh, you know, people are being really harsh. Uh, you know, I'm a big proponent of gay, transgender people. That there's a mm -hmm. lot of hate and discrimination going on against gay and transgender people. All right. I'll have to stop this again here. <laughs> no, thing. there isn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, same thing. This is just like the black voter nonsense. It's something that you're told and He's you're just, just supposed to believe. saying things without proof. Right. These are just sort of left-wing talking points. Um, hate and violence against gay and transgender people. If you no. say something enough, I mean, people just believe it's true right that's all it is he's and just, that's what they're doing right they just say it. it um you don't know why and without looking into it, you just go i guess it's true right now there is pushback against the lgbtq agenda uh, that's sort of like commandeering every aspect of our society um there's pushback you know against the sort of purposeful indoctrination the in intentional indoctrination mm -hmm. of our children yeah. into that sinful lifestyle. Yeah, there's real pushback against that, which there should be. But hatred and violence, there is not. Uh, and probably any increase in violence in that community can be attributed back to that community. And I think we talked about this maybe months or a year mm -hmm. ago or something. Um, but and I just went and found some quick stats. But uh 40% of Lesbian women experience intimate partner violence in their lifetime. 61% uh, of bisexual women experience rape, physical violence, and stalking by an inter intimate partner. And 54% of trans and non-binary people experience intimate partner violence. So um, it would just make sense that the more LGBTQ couples that we have in this nation, the more instances of abuse they will suffer, unfortunately, but at their own hands, right? Yeah. Because lesbians are in relationships with women. That's what makes them a lesbian. So if 40% of them are being abused, it's by lesbian women, right? Um, odds are most transgendered couples, they're not necessarily in traditional heterosexual couples. Um, mm -hmm. it, so. Is there a rise in violence? Maybe. Is it coming from anywhere outside of their own community? 
I would say maybe in a pretty small amount, I would guess, right? Uh, you know, it's like the Nashville shooter type of situation, right? Sure, some people may have made fun of him, gave him a hard time. Maybe he goes and shoots up a school and we're supposed to consider that trans violence of some sort. No, like that was a mentally ill person that killed children. <laughs> he wasn't a victim. He was a monster. Uh, so anyways, just a side note. We'll continue. And I always want to make sure I stand up against any form of discrimination. And I feel very good, very confident. Like I say, I don't think I'm always right, but if I see any hatred, you know, we got a lot of anti-Semitism going on right yeah. now. I'm standing up for those people because I want them to stand up for me. That goes back to my original thing. <laughs> so, again, I just wanted to point this out. You know, he said, I always stand up for them because I want them to stand up for me. And in what way? What is he what is he thinking? In, well, him in what regards? I don't know. I mean, and if he ever and again, Charles Barkley's never gonna suffer racism or, you know, offend I mean, he's a he's a rich celebrity. I mean, everyone knows Charles and loves him. So whatever sort of uh racism or intolerance he suspects he might face someday is unlikely to happen. Really weird. But even this point just seems like a very self-serving point to me. He says he wants to stand up for these groups that, you know, the Jews and the LGBTQ community so that they will stand up for him. He doesn't say I want to stand up for them because standing up for them is right. But so that they'll come to his defense should he need them. But you could say that about any group of people. Right. You know? But the right mindset, the mindset of somebody who cares for people is, I want to stand up for them because they deserve to be stood up for. They deserve to have rights and respect. Not, hey, man, I want to stand up for them so that when things get rough for me, they'll come to my defense. I mean. Yeah, I know what you mean. That's just, it's a, just kind of a. I don't know. Odd, self-serving way to try to, like, I don't know, be a knight of some sort. I don't know. Um, anyways, that's not the point I wanted to get to either. We're just making our way through this. So let's continue on. Up for those people because I want them to stand up for me. That goes back to my original thing. Like, hey, man, I want allies. I'm not trying to alienate anybody. I don't want to be on an island by myself. Anybody want to help black people? I want your help. I want your support. Let's just stop there. <laughs> Can you explain that one? Yeah. So, you know, he said, hey, man, I'm not trying to alienate anybody. I just want allies. Um, but again, just not really true. Uh, just recently on Charles Barkley's own show, uh, he has a show, I guess, called King Charles. Um, so again, you know, this is something he says on his own show. So he wasn't goaded into it, right? He wasn't on somebody else's show and tricked into it. This was a show he had. And he said that he would punch anyone that he sees wearing a Trump shirt. So uh, let me see. He says, uh, Barkley told his co-host, Gail King, on the CNN show, King Charles Saturday, Saturday, that if he sees a black person walking around with a Trump mugshot, he'd punch them in the face adding that he means that sincerely. Uh, so apparently there are certain allies that Charles Barkley doesn't actually want. There are certain right. people he doesn't actually mind alienating. And would you guess it just so happens to be the people that the liberal establishment has told him not to like. Go figure. Uh, you know, the same people who told him that you know, black people are being restricted from voting without any evidence. Big shocker there. So he wants allies. But if you're wearing a Trump shirt, he's going to punch you in the face. Um, wow. All righty then. So let's Violence. continue on. Yep. That's the way. Now, to be fair, I will just say he did try to walk this statement back again, you know, after the fact. But he did say in that clip, I will punch him in the face sincerely <laughs> like i mean this i will do it and then somebody was like charles brother you can't say that and he's like i apologize i don't want to punch you in the face and we're supposed to believe that i guess i don't know uh, maybe he's being honest 
Who knows? But let's keep this thing moving. Great, great life and career. I just think he's too old to be the president. And uh, I, and and uh, President Trump, man, I I don't want our president acting like that. Right. You know, whether I disagree with your apologies or whatever, there's a certain dignity that goes with being president of the United States. I can disagree. No question. Yeah, I consider myself. A- <laughs> Ah, uh, so. Do we really need to point it out? I have to point it out. So consider this argument from Charles and Stephen A. So this is Charles again, who said he would punch people in the face for wearing a shirt he didn't like. Um, and as a younger man in Charles Barkley's day, he was a very feisty fella. Um, he's spit on a fan at a game which just so happened to land on a little girl at that game, uh, I believe. So a man who was not known for carrying himself in a dignified manner. And then there's Stephen A. Smith here who says, absolutely, who just a few weeks ago went on an hour-long, childish, idiotic tirade, cursing and insulting Jason Whitlock. Yet here these two are saying... (laughs) The president should carry himself in a certain manner, a manner in which these two fellas won't carry themselves in. Again, he thinks the president can just go up and punch someone. He doesn't like what they stand for. No, no. This is Charles Barkley. I'm just saying. Oh, right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. If he's considering himself being dignified. Right. That's the standard. But this is just what we said with Secretary Austin, right? It's for me, but not for thee. I can carry myself however I want. But you in that other office over there, you should be more dignified. You should be different than the rest of us. How should I behave? Well, of course, however I want. But you should be different. Now, of course, that's not why they don't like Donald Trump, right? They're just making up arguments as to why they don't like him. I'm assuming, I don't know their thoughts, just assuming that's make-believe, right? Um, They don't like Donald Trump because of the way he acts, and it's undignified for the office. Yet here's Charles Barkley spitting on little girls, Stephen A. Smith cursing and insulting somebody like a a teenager. And we're supposed to believe like, well, these guys know about being dignified. Mm -hmm. Give me a break. Um, But anyways, let's keep this thing moving. The United States, I can disagree. No question. Yeah, I consider myself an independent. Uh, I voted Democratic. So do I. Yeah, I vote Democratic most of the time, and so do I. Yeah, but I think that we got to start doing a better job, uh, Stephen A. Because I have voted Democratic my entire life, but I think they've been doing a disservice to Black people. And that don't mean I want them to go out there and vote Republican now. Let's get that shit out the right. way. But every Black person I've known my entire life has always voted Democratic. And I said to myself, well, damn, other than me ducking a basketball, everybody else in the exact same boat. And I think we got to do a much better job if we vote Democratic to hold them accountable and do more instead of showing up in our neighborhoods every four years and say, vote for us. And that's what they've actually been doing for the last as long as I've been alive. Because, you know, these neighborhoods are the same. These schools are the same. The economic opportunities are the same. And like I say, I just don't like the way President, I don't, I just don't like the way President Trump carries himself. Okay. So President Trump probably has some good policies, but he doesn't like the way he carries himself. But what if he could make a, a change for the communities? It's not worth it. You don't like his way well, he carries himself. Well, that's what he himself. says, right? He told you, hey, I'm not telling you to vote for Republicans, right? Think how unintelligent that opinion is. Yeah. That is one of the, I mean, again, you know, who was it? Was it the uh, Jeff Foxworthy, that stand-up comedy show, the Redneck Comedy or whatever? Who was the guy that used to always say, here's your sign? Like, you just want to be like, Charles, here's your sign, dude. He just sits there and goes. He says it and doesn't even get it. I don't want anyone voting for Republican. But I look around and I realize... We've been voting Democrat all these years and nothing's changed. Like that, ladies and gentlemen, um, that is some deep-rooted indoctrination. 
So please see that and recognize it for what it is and rid your own life of that sort of thought process. Yeah. I mean, listen to him. He just says, I mean, he says in there outside of a basketball, which he's saying outside of me being supremely gifted athletically and being rich because of my athleticism, everybody I know is in the exact same poverty ridden downcast position that we've been in forever. And we've been voting this same way. And then he tells you, but I ain't saying vote differently. Well, why not? What are you talking about? And again, we're not on this show telling you to vote for Republican. They stink by and large for the most part. But just the idea that even if you were voting Republican your whole life and you realized that your lot in life had never gotten any better, wouldn't you at least go, maybe I should change something? Yeah. Right. If you live in some deep red part of the country and your life has stunk for generations, try something different. Vote libertarian. <laughs> like, He'll vote know. for a Republican as long as they carry themselves the way he he likes. Well, of course, that that's the one thing he's certainly looking for. Just a dignified man who, no, he's going to vote Democrat because it's apparently deep rooted indoctrination that it you is. just vote D no yeah. matter what. Um, he doesn't even know why. And it's funny, they mention in here, you know, they talk about he was going to have a, apparently he was going to have a conversation with Nikki Haley and he wanted to address something with her because Nikki Haley, I guess, made the point that there's no racism in America, which I've made on this show before and I stand by. And by and large, if you're talking about maybe three or 4% of real racism in America. In a nation this large, that's effectively zero. Um, and he makes the point that well, I agree with Nikki Haley, as long as you don't pay attention to slavery, Jim Crow and segregation, which again, somebody should remind Charles, those don't exist in this nation anymore. Um, but then it's funny, because even during that, uh, Stephen A. Smith mentions as he's going civil or slavery, segregation, Jim Crow, Stephen A. Smith goes, civil war, <laughs> civil war is an example of racism. You know, the war that was fought against our own selves, our own countrymen. Many white men died to end slavery in this nation. Oh my god! But in Stephen A. Smith's mind, that's an example of racism in America. Killing each other to end racism somehow is still racism. So even ending oh. slavery in America is racist nowadays. <laughs> Think about where we've gotten to in this society. If you even stop slavery, you're a racist. You're like, what? If you own and slave, you're a racist. If you set him free, you're a racist. And what is being anti-racist I don't, to them? Uh, I don't know. I mean, I don't know how you can keep your head wrapped around all of this. So, um, Yikes. But I got one more well. clip from this, and it was the whole reason I wanted to play this clip. So let's get to this last and most important clip from Stephen A. and Charles Barkley. Let me share uh, a few opinions with you and let me get your reaction to them. I'm just going to give it up to you in one lump sum. I am a fiscal conservative and a social liberal, which makes me an independent. I'm all for liberalism on the social side. I'm about gay rights, transgender rights, et cetera, et cetera, uh, pro-choice. I don't believe I have a right to tell a woman what to do with her body. Um, but in the same breath, when we look at a lot of policies that come raking through Capitol Hill or sifting through Capitol Hill, one of the things that obviously plays a role in every single decision that is made, they ask you how you're going to pay for it. Like Planned Parenthood. Okay, pro-choice. You can be pro-choice, but do you think somebody has the right to say that, you know what, if I wanted an abortion, that federal funding should subsidize that? So you think about things like that. That's one mm -hmm. thing. I oh, what a nuanced and intelligent <laughs> position to take. Uh, this is really the whole reason why I wanted to bring up and discuss this Charles Barkley and Stephen A. Smith podcast. Um, the rest of it, I just felt needed some addressing along the way. Um, but it's this statement from Stephen A. Smith that caught my attention originally and has been turning over in my mind that I wanted to at least mention here on this show. Um, 
He says that he's a social liberal and a fiscal conservative, and that makes him an independent. No, <laughs> it doesn't. It makes him a liberal. Uh, but worse, it makes him a greedy liberal is what it makes him. Um, now, I'm getting somewhere with all of this. I'm not just trying to point out the things that they talk about here. I have a reason for this. Um, but I just want to get some of this stuff, again, off my chest. I think it's worth addressing along the way. You know, socially liberal and fiscally conservative is like the gentleman's way of saying, I want to be as sexually deviant as I desire, and I don't want anyone touching my money. <laughs> it's perverse and it's greedy. That is not some nuanced, intelligent, independently formed way of thinking. Like if you wanted to be an actual independent with some credibility, be socially conservative and fiscally liberal. Be like, you know, I'm a man of traditional values and I'll give my entire fortune to make sure those things happen. You don't find many of those people nowadays, right? You don't see those folks walking around that are socially uh, conservative and fiscally liberal very often, right? That would be a true independent in my mind. Socially liberal, fiscally conservative, you're a Hollywood elite, essentially. That's the same nonsense they all talk about for the most part. I want to have sex with who I want to have sex with. They want to get an abortion. It's better for me because now I don't have a kid to take care of because don't touch my money. Hmm. Um, uh, so to me, and again, I could be completely wrong. Please feel free to correct me if I am. I just don't think I am right. You know, from Stephen A. Smith, what I hear when I hear this is greed and perversion dressed up as intellectual. So I would warn you, don't be fooled by such talk. Uh, and really Stephen A to me is a man who kind of only does what he wants, right? He's socially devi or a social, socially liberal, which is like that. Let me be a deviant sexually kind of mindset. He's fiscally conservative. I'm greedy. Get your hands off my money. But then because of things I've heard from him recently, this even extends to like his so-called faith, which I probably disagree that he actually has based on recent evidence, if you will. Um, you know, I mentioned his childish tirade earlier, and I want to play you just a few short clips from that tirade, and then we'll get back to this. The things that I'm going to say, um, please don't hold anybody responsible for it other than me. Nobody. I even took the liberty of calling my pastor to apologize in advance for what I'm going to say about that no good. I literally called my pastor and asked for his forgiveness and understanding in advance because he's not going to recognize the person he's about to hear. So I have one more clip that I want to play from Stephen A, but just really quick, again, highlighting his potentially lack of faith or real faith there. Um, forgiveness doesn't actually work that way, right? your pastor, first off, doesn't forgive you necessarily from anything. God forgives you. Mm -hmm. um, now, he does mention this pastor's name, who is A.R. Bernard. I'm sure A.R. Bernard informed him of this, right? That he didn't actually need forgiveness from him, but God, maybe, right? I'm not sure. Um, and also, you aren't repenting of something that you acknowledge is like wrong, Right. And then you go ahead and do anyways. You're not actually like repenting of that in advance. It doesn't work that way. Um, that is pride and it's unrepentant pride at that. Uh, this is a gross sin. You're saying this is a sin that is necessary and doesn't really need repenting of. Right. It's like, look, I've got to go down this road. I have to sin against this man. It's necessary. Um, but once I'm done, I will repent and be granted forgiveness. Like, no, no. I mean, if you stopped ahead of time, you realized it was wrong, right? You know that what you're doing is a sin. This is a gross sin, right? Um, and it's made grosser in the fact that he's trying to like wrap Christ's name into it somehow. I called my pastor. I'm repenting in advance, but it just has to be done. No, it doesn't. It doesn't have to be done. Uh, this is a shame on Stephen A. Smith. And I would say... 
the repentance he mentions here, he didn't actually get, but he is in some serious need of repentance for this, I would say. Um, and it's just worse just, that he even had to bring up that he asked his pastor, like, just why? Why is he? He's trying to portray himself. Yeah, you'd think if you were the pastor, you'd be a little upset that you kind of got thrown under the bus by Stephen A. So, yeah. you know, he says that he calls his pastor, which is this A.R. Bernard fella who um, is a visionary. And if you're not a believer in that, A.R. Bernard will tell you on his own website that he is a visionary. <laughs> pastor A.R. Bernard is a visionary pastor. Okay, um, if you say so. Uh, where else? I think it says it on here again. Follow one of America's most visionary Christian leaders on YouTube. Most visionary. That's his website. Doesn't it seem weird to like call yourself a visionary on your own site? Um, I don't know. Seems weird to me. But um, here is A.R. Bernard's response. So Stephen A. said, I called my pastor. And I told him I'm going to have to repent because you ain't going to recognize who I am. Well, how did A.R. Bernard, this visionary, influential Christian pastor, let's hear how he responded. And they begged me not to do this. But even my pastor, A.R. Bernard, said, I'm not happy about it. But every now and then we got to do what we got to do. <laughs> what? Wait, what is he calling him out for? What is it that he's uh, got to do? This is, uh, uh, well, if you listen, and I do not recommend you listen to this Stephen A. Smith podcast where he's responding to Jason Whitlock, not only is it sinful, full of cursing and name calling, but it is horrifyingly embarrassing. Um, it's just dripping with pride and arrogance. It's a dreadful, is dreadful so, look for Stephen A. Smith. So Stephen A. Smith is letting everybody know, if they didn't already know, he's a Christian. Jason Whitlock is a Christian. So he's showing everybody how one brother no, no, confronts no. another brother. Um, and they're, I'm if, just saying. If like, you listen to the podcast, Stephen A. Smith makes clear that he sees Jason Whitlock as Cain. He is Cain who committed the first murder <laughs> Stephen A. It's ludicrous. What he says in here, wild. Um, but he talks about, I called my pastor and the advice that he got from his pastor. Again, A.R. Bernard, feel free to clear the air, correct the record. He calls him and says, listen, pastor, I'm about to go in, right? I'm about to go on a worldwide broadcast and lay down a profanity-laced, pride-soaked, immature, childish tirade, and the visionary A.R. Bernard told him, sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. What was what? it on the um, the church website even said he was a thought leader? Is that the same thing? I guess. What does that mean? Thought leader. I don't know. It's like being a life coach where anybody nowadays is just a thought leader. Hey, I said something. I'm a thought leader. I don't know. Um, because this was a dumb thought, if this is what A.R. Bernard actually said. Because only two things can really be true, right? In my opinion, right? Stephen A. Smith is lying about calling his pastor beforehand. Or his pastor is not a man of God. And anyone who knows A.R. Bernard, if this is true, if Stephen A. Smith called him, told him, and was told by A.R. Bernard, sometimes you got to do what you got to do. If that's true, they should rebuke A.R. Bernard and potentially leave him if you are at his church. You just flee that level of teaching. Um, I think I even posted this on the video for Stephen A. Smith. Like, that is not Christian advice. I will help you out, right? Matthew 5, what is it, 13? Blessed are you when they revile you. Um, let me see. It's probably on here. Uh, yeah, blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That's sound Christian advice. Sometimes you got to do what you got to do. That's awful advice. 
Um, and like in the same vein, you know, and again, this is why it really um, stuck out to me. You know, Shannon Sharp recently said the same thing. In a sense, he got into an argument um, with Mike Epps about being on his show and back and forth. Mike Epps, I guess, went on some comedy tour and was calling Shannon Sharp gay, a bunch of stuff. And Shannon Sharp was like, he didn't care about being called gay. Call him whatever names you want. Call me gay. It doesn't matter. But he said, if it affects my bottom line, then he's going to do something about it. And Shannon Sharp kind of made the point that like he's going to go and beat up Mike Epps when he sees him because he's messing with his, his bank account. Um, and that should not be the case. Again, thinking of this from a Christian perspective, somebody slandering your name, that should be bothersome to you, right? Because your character, you should try to be above reproach, you know, not bring shame on the name of God. And if you lose a few shekels along the way, so be it, as long as Christ's name is honored. But in the world's mind, in these supposed thought leaders of our day, Stephen A. and Shannon Sharp and these guys, call me whatever you want, slander me any way you want, but you start affecting my bank account? Nah, we got things to say now. It's a completely backwards, worldly, secular, unchristlike mindset. Um, and that was kind of the whole reason why I wanted to bring this up. If you guys remember the Cat Williams interview that Shannon Sharp did. We discussed that episode a few weeks ago. Um, Cat Williams during that mentioned that there were um, people that were installed in Hollywood to push a certain narrative. That was kind of what caught everybody off guard, what Cat mm -hmm. Williams was saying. Well, Jason Whitlock went and made that connection to the sports media world. And his main piece of evidence is Stephen A. Smith. That's what the whole point of Stephen A. Smith's tirade was about. Jason Whitlock went on a couple episodes of his show pointing out kind of the lies and the frauds that Stephen A. Smith's career is built on. And he's like, hey, man, this dude's kind of like made up out of thin air. Like none of this stuff seems authentic and real. Um, so, you know, Stephen A. kind of talks about, oh, Jason's been doing this for 10 years and I finally had enough and I had to lay into him. But it was kind of prompted off of, Jason Whitlock calling him out in light of what Cat Williams had started been or started started exposing. Um, and I would just say that the evidence certainly seems to point to the fact that Stephen A. Smith might not be the man that he claims to be. Um, you know, so if that's true, why would he be there? That was kind of my whole point here, right? With these guys, these Stephen A. Smith, the Shannon Sharps, like, why are they there? Right? Stephen A. Smith has really no qualifications to be the biggest voice in American sports media. Uh, he has no sports acumen to fall back on, you know, he, in a world that is like all about your credibility as an athlete in the sports world, Stephen A. Smith has none. He doesn't even really have journalistic acumen to the degree that you would expect, like a Mitch album or, you know, these, um, Bob Costas and these sort of guys that, you know, have been award winning. Even Jason Whitlock has won awards as a columnist and a journalist for years and years, right? Stephen A. Smith doesn't really have that. And yet somehow he's become the face of sports talk. Um, well, if you believe Cat Williams and you believe Jason Whitlock, maybe he's there for this reason, what he's talking about here. I'm a social liberal fiscal conservative, you know, pro-abortion, pushing the Democrat, you know, token black agenda Just a to the masses, right? Because yeah. it seems reasonable to me to assume that Stephen A. Smith is there because the executives want him there. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't think Stephen A. is alone, you know? Like, when you think about the media landscape, there's maybe like 50, like, super high-end like anchor jobs in America between, you know, the different networks and sports and different, you know, entertainment cultures or whatever. And these jobs pay incredible salaries. I think Stephen A makes somewhere between 12 and $15 million a year. And that's just in his like ESPN salary. He may make a couple million elsewhere. I don't know what he makes, but like, don't you think 
like, let's just say that on a low end, right? There's a, a few hundred thousand people, at least in this nation, that would say or do anything. They would tell any lie or take any position on any issue to make 12 to $15 million a year and be world famous. You don't think there's a couple hundred thousand people that would do that? Uh, I think you'd be crazy to think that that's not true. And I would guess several hundred thousand is a very low number. I think the actual number of people that would lie, say or do anything for that amount of money and fame mm -hmm. is drastically higher. Like, remember, we're 6% Christian in this nation. That means 94% of the rest of this country, at least to some level, are in play. Well, right? yeah, 6% actually have a biblical worldview. So all those who even profess to be Christian, they're not part of that 6%. No, that's what I mean. They're in yeah. play as well, right? Because they, they are as have well. Because there's so many people like, no, they wouldn't lie because they are professing Christians. And Right. I mean, yeah. the prosperity gospel mindset of like, well, I'm I'm prospering, I'm rich and successful, might be must be right where the Lord wants me, right? Um, so this is important what Stephen A and Shannon and Charles and them are talking about because these people, right, the Stephen A's of the world, they're influential people, and I think they're supposed to be, and they're especially influential to younger folks. Like if you're out there listening and you're in your you know 60s or 70s, you may not care who or what Stephen A. Smith is or Shannon Sharp's talking about. You don't care about them at all, but your kids do. Um, and that's why this is important. These people, at least again, it would seem to me, are in the places they are and they're saying the things that they're saying for a purpose. And I don't believe it's by accident. Um, I think that's the big point that Kat and Jason Whitlock were getting to. Um, and again, you can call me a conspiracy theory, a kook, whatever you want to call me. Um, but we're in a world, remember, right? That's ruled by the father of lies. Um, and almost every person of national or international fame promotes the exact same message. Why would that be? Right. Uh, you know, it's sexual perversion and it's greed. It's the same message. And that simply cannot be coincidence. Um, and then, you know, even further, keep in mind that Stephen A. Smith works for ESPN and ESPN is ultimately owned by Disney, which is Groomer Inc., right? Um, they are, you know, Satan's entertainment arm, if you will. So like your teenage kid, if you have teenagers or you even have young adult kids, they're not listening to Wolf Blitzer in PBS. That's not who they're watching, right? But if they're into sports at all, they're probably listening to Stephen A. Smith, Shannon Sharp, Charles Barkley. Um, and this is the message they're being fed. Uh, and that's kind of the big point. It comes from all sides. This level of like sinfulness and depravity of mindset. It comes from all sides. So we need to be on guard against all sides. You know, Stephen A. Smith is sort of presented as this intellectual in the sports world. He's even beginning more and more to be presented as an intellectual and a uh, of influential thought leader, even into the political world. You know, he's talked about that on Howard Stern. You know, people want me to go into politics and all this sort of stuff. He's being promoted as that. Mm -hmm. um, so then you have, you know, that sinful idea. But again, right, he's even trying to, you know, subtly, but he is trying to wrap in some idea of faith. Mm -hmm. And that makes his message very dangerous to our society. That somehow this is the faithful. This is what my pastor is agreeing with. And, you know, he knows who I am, this social liberal, pro-abortion, LGBTQ. It's all good. My pastor even agrees with it. That is dangerous. And we need to be aware that that's what's being promoted. Because, you know, you might think, well, I ain't listening to my, letting my kids listen to MSNBC. That stuff's garbage. Good for you. It is garbage. But if they're sitting down watching... Sports Center, First Take, um, the Stephen A. Smith podcast, they're hearing the same thing, right? It's the same message being promoted to them, the same worldly, secular, godless mindset. So 
that's the reason I wanted to bring up Stephen A. Smith, right? Was for that little bit, man. They're being presented to us as these, you know, intellectual thought leaders, but then they're the voice of sports media and they're influential. And, you know, I don't have to be wrapped up in politics. I'm just listening to Stephen A. Smith, but you're getting the same message. True. And we need to be on guard against that because that's an ungodly message. And that's an ungodly mindset. And it needs to be guarded against. It needs to be talked about with your kids. I'm not telling you can't ever listen to Stephen A. Smith in first take again. I mean, I don't know what I'm telling you other than that's not a Christian or Christ-like mindset and attitude. And it's dangerous because that stuff your kids, young adults may be listening to that you aren't aware of, right? You might right. be smart enough and in tune enough to be like, you're not listening to MSNBC and we're not listening to Fox News in this house but they're still getting it here. So we need to be on guard against it here. It's exhausting, right? It's exhausting to be uh, combating this stuff all the time, but this is the world we live in. You know where they're at too? I just learned that, yeah, I didn't know this, that there's, you know, even the Bible app is a form of social media. Oh they yeah. Get on there and chat with whoever and they could be learning around their Bible app, but then someone else just talking to them about, oh, this is what this scripture means. And yeah, wait till we get into our Reddit Christianity, right? I'm, I'm on Reddit Christianity trying to share the faith. What are they actually hearing there? Probably not godly. Um, so yeah. it's tiring, right? But in the digital age that we live in, it's everywhere. You can't avoid it. Um, so again, you may not care about culture, all this sort of stuff, but your kids do. And it's tiring. It's exhausting but we can't just turn a blind eye to it. You know, ignorance isn't an excuse. Laziness, being tired isn't an excuse. Um, well, I just didn't know anything about it, so I didn't say anything. That's not an excuse. You have to do the work now. Uh, and it, believe me, it's tiring. But, you know, just sticking your kid in front of a sports, you know, show or whatever it is, that's not safe anymore either. You got to be guarding against that stuff either because this poison... We'll get into their mind from there just as easily, maybe even more easily than if they're watching a dedicated, you know, political kind of show. So do you have any last thoughts on Stephen A. Smith, industry plants that are looking to pervert our minds and lead us into sinful lifestyles? No, we can move on to the next. <laughs>